This video was made possible due to those who support me at patreon.com slash millennial model mayhem. Wonderful, Jack! I knew that machine was special! Congratulations, you've been selected as the final protagonist. <laughs> What's up people, my name is Liam and welcome to the Millennial Model Mayhem Content Zone. Today I'm presenting the final addition to my collection of kitbashed and hand-painted gunpla projects for the tabletop game Gamma Wolves by Ash Barker. If you're new to my channel, the first three projects in this series ended up becoming the crew known as the Antagonists, and the following three projects have been additions to the crew known as the Protagonists. And this project will be the fourth member of the protagonists. I was working with a set deadline on this project, so my main focus was to see how fast I could complete it, but at the same time I also wanted to push myself with the color gradients that I typically do on these styles of projects. It's going to be a test of how well my gradients and edge highlights can distract from any imperfections, as well as pushing the limits of tabletop quality, which I explained a bit more in detail in my video for Protagonist 3. So I'm very much looking forward to showing you the process for customizing this Master Grade Buster Gundam model kit. Sore de wa gunpura o kumitatemasu! I don't think I'll be using any of these. Gonna put you with the other minifigures. Thank you. 
another bountiful harvest of sprinkles. I've had this Master Grade Buster Gundam in my backlog for a while now. It was originally purchased from my local retailer because it seemed like really good value for the price. As someone with a background in painting miniatures, Gunpla almost always seems like a great deal when compared to the prices Games Workshop sells their Warhammer models at. Price to plastic ratio aside, I think the design of this model is great, and the big guns this mobile suit carries have a few different configurations to play around with. When I finished building, I immediately noticed and started getting excited about all the detail already present on the armor, and how I would be able to bring out all that detail with my hand painting techniques. This aspect of the kit also gives me a good segue to explain my thought process when it comes to kit bashing which is basically to have an overall idea of what combat role I want the mech to have, and after figuring out how to execute that, just modify the parts that I don't like or stand out in any negative way. While I do think the big guns are pretty cool, I also found them slightly frustrating to pose properly, and the protagonist's crew already has a long-range damage dealer with Oxyodl, so I'm gonna put these aside for a future potential kit bash. Therefore, I no longer need these attachment points on the backpack. There are also these shoulder pieces on the side that hinder the range of arm articulation that I'm removing, so now I've got to figure out what I'll be replacing these components with. I keep my extra 1-100 scale pieces in a separate bag from the rest of the kit bashing material, and the main idea I had for this kit bash before I even started building was to use these pieces from the Premium Bandai Master Grade Barbatos expansion. They're technically waste boosters, but I've been thinking that they would be well suited as some kind of shield and melee weapon hybrid. Like I did with Protagonist 3, aka Oxyodl, I'm gonna use these 3D printed G parts from StudioG.store to help tie the kit bashed elements together and enhance a few areas. There isn't much else I want to modify other than the weapons, so the only other pieces from this bag I'll be bashing onto the buster are these red ones for the shoulders and these white ones to replace the side skirts that were attached to the guns. These pieces also happen to be from Master Grade Barbatos. The feet to be precise. Wow, you sure have gotten a lot of value from that Master Grade Barbatos expansion over the last year. It's just like you said. And I simp for Barbatos. Before I start executing this kit bash, I'm going to quickly show you how I get the base ready for painting. For the smaller models, I typically use those 100mm Reaper bases that only need a bit of cleanup around the edges, but for the bigger 130mm bases, I use this Games Workshop type that has texture across the surface. This texture is useful for traditional wargaming basing, but for the abstract turquoise pattern I've been doing on my Gamma Wolves projects, I need it to be totally flat so I'm going to achieve that with some thin plastic card. After tracing out the circle and cutting it out with a hobby knife, I use Tamiya plastic cement to glue it down, then the extra thin version of the glue along the edge to make sure it's properly sealed along the entire rim. Once the glue is dried, I slowly go along the edge with my blade to even out the rough edges of the circle from when I cut it out of the plastic card. I'm not aiming for a perfect edge at this point because that can be taken care of when I get to sanding after the kit bashing is complete. Speaking of kit bashing, I'm dealing with the torso first, and I don't feel any need to change anything with the head or chest since there is already plenty of nice detail for painting. With the shoulders, however, I need to cover up the exposed holes from where I removed those beige pieces, which I'm going to do with these small feet pieces and G parts. All there is to do is figure out where I'm going to glue the red piece, then find an appropriate G part for the empty space, and make it fit with a bit of sanding from my heavy duty metal files. I need to use super glue to attach the G part to the red piece, but I use plastic cement to attach the two gunpla pieces together for a stronger bond. And that's the shoulders finished. There are similar holes that need to be covered up on the backpack, which can mostly be done with these circle pieces that were originally part of the weapon attachment points, but I'm going to add an appropriately sized G part to help it blend in better. Just like the shoulders, I'm doing a bit of sanding to get the pieces to fit right, 
then attaching them with super glue and using plastic cement to mount the new arrangement to the backpack. With that, the minor modifications to the torso are complete. Next up are the waist and legs. Just like the last section, I'm pretty satisfied with the detail as is, but I did find one flat section on the back calf vent that I thought could use some G-parts, so I used the same pieces that were added to the backpack. And that's all I'm doing with the legs. With the waist, however, I've got slightly more complex work to do in creating some new side skirts. My plan is to use these feet pieces because it seems like they'll be a decent fit, but first I'm going to use a combination of two similar G parts to fill in the empty section, which needs to be cut down a bit with the hobby knife in order to get them to fit. Then while I'm waiting for the super glue on those G parts to dry, I'm using the saw and files to cut down the white piece to have a straight edge in order to better fit onto the waist. Then I'm gluing a leftover poly cap from the bits box under the empty space so I have an attachment point to super glue the G parts to. The G parts are gonna be the attachment point to the waist, but I've gotta wait until I lock in the final pose before I glue them on. I also need to do a bit of gap filling to hide the seam between the G parts. Like I did with the back of the legs, I thought the front waist flaps had enough empty space to justify gluing more G parts in to fill the void. So this time I'm using the same G parts that were on the shoulders. Finally, I didn't like the way the middle waist piece looked. So I rummaged through the bits box again, found this random gold part, cut and glued it down in size. Then after removing some of the original pieces and carving a slightly larger space with the hobby knife, I glued the new piece of mechanical detail into the empty cavity. Now the last and most important section to kit bash is the arms where I'm going to turn those Barbatos waist thrusters into melee weapons. The process here is fairly simple because all I need to do is determine where exactly I want them to be mounted to the forearms, then use the saw and files to get this ridge flat enough to attach with super glue. Lastly, I added a couple G parts to help tie the parts together a bit, and with that, my lazy kit bashing process is complete. I thought about modifying this ball joint into some kind of handle, but since I gotta go fast, I thought that leaving part of the peg sticking out looked good enough as some kind of sci-fi magnetic mount or something. Plus, with the pose I have in mind, it won't really be a section that's easily noticed. On that same note, I did also consider buying some putty to fill in the hollow sections on the underside, but decided against it for similar reasons. I'll admit, my kit bashing is definitely a little janky, so I definitely appreciate it when other skilled builders can pull off kit bashes or scratch builds with full articulation, and I'm sure I could reach somewhere like that with enough practice, but for now, I like to focus on painting. I recommend checking out Otaku Builder's work if you want to see some kit bashes that absolutely slap. Now once I've decided on what pose I want, it's time to mostly lock it in place so I can properly mount it to the base and paint it like a miniature. First, I used plastic cement to glue a couple problem areas that were continually falling off during all the posing and kit bashing. Then after that comes the tricky part with the thin kind of super glue. Like I said with my previous projects, I like to lock the joints in place where I know moving parts would risk paint damage or expose unpainted sections when moved. So once I've determined the bend I'm committed to, I carefully line up the glue nozzle and really quickly pour in just the bare minimum amount of glue into the joint. You have to be really careful with this thin glue because it's easily over poured and will leave a noticeable texture behind that you'll have to sand smooth. You can see on the leg here how I quickly wipe up the excess with that cloth before it dries, and also how on the foot I used a bit too much glue which caused the excess to seep into this ankle piece and make it crack. Wasn't a total tragedy though because I was able to use the thicker super glue and sanding to fill the gap and I was still able to maintain some articulation in the shoulders and head. Either way, I have no regrets about transforming this gunpla into a tabletop gaming piece. Think of the times when you've gotten frustrated with posing a model when it has stability issues, or it's got problems holding the weapons or stuff like that, and then imagine putting that into a tabletop game setting where you have to do relatively precise measurements, or there's dice rolling across the table, and you have to pick up and move the model frequently. Perhaps this is just a hyper-specific problem to me as a person who's into gunpla and miniatures. 
But uh, that's just the point, isn't it? Live your own truth, and do whatever you want with your model kits. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> the last thing to do before applying any paint is my least favorite part, sanding. I'll admit that I could more effectively do this stage if I did it with the model fully disassembled, but like I said at the beginning, I'm trying to focus on being fast with this project and reach tabletop quality. So if I miss an area, I'm prepared to rely on the painting to be the main thing the eyes focus on. The painting begins with priming everything in Vallejo Black Surface Primer, then spraying some dark iron onto the exposed underframe. Except this time, I'm adding a bit of Forest Flux shifter paint to the mix, just as a little treat. Before I get to any brush work, you may have noticed a subtle difference in my desktop lighting. And that's because BenQ sent me one of their e-reading lamps to review. They describe the product as having a highly flexible swing arm and solid base that can be moved in whichever way you want on the workspace. It provides a good lighting source for all shadows and highlights, and has customizable color temperature and brightness. Along with a color rendering index above 95, the lamp gives an accurate color representation on your workspace. With a wide lighting coverage and zero flicker technology, this lamp is capable of creating an evenly illuminated area at a 35 inch light range and a maximum illuminance of 1800 lux. Now they sent me this lamp for free, but haven't paid to sponsor this video, so here are my honest thoughts. So in terms of design, build quality, and functionality, it definitely does not disappoint, it feels like a premium product. I do have a few small complaints though, one being that the knob for adjusting the color temperature at the top doesn't have any specific notches to indicate what position it's in which I understand would conflict with the minimalist design a bit, but as someone who works with cameras a lot, it's slightly annoying to have to remember the correct amount of notches I need to turn in order to get to the temperature I need. And also, I wish that the product just came with the clamp style mount that's shown in the manual, because that would free up some desk space for me, and it seems like a small enough accessory that it could just fit in the original packaging. Despite these minor gripes though, I definitely enjoy this lamp and will continue to use it. Thanks to BenQ for supporting my work. Now it's time to get back to painting. Before I get back to work on the model itself, it's time to do the base in the same style that I've done the previous six, which I still haven't grown tired of. I start off by penciling in the pattern on the fly over top of the layer of gray Vallejo surface primer. Then, once I'm satisfied with the abstract lines, I go over them again with a black marker. Next, I block in the three colors of coal black, meridius blue, and arcane blue in a way where there shouldn't be any of the same colors next to each other in the neighboring shapes. Because I come up with this pattern on the fly though, there are usually a few spots where I break this rule, which is totally okay for me since the base is just meant to complement the model itself, and I can also strategically place the feet on the pattern to cover up any inconsistencies. Once the initial layers are on, I start applying a second coat to strengthen the vibrancy, while also getting some of the blending started by mixing the colors together while they're still wet. This is a technique I briefly mentioned last video called wet blending. Once the foundations for the three colors are solid, I add glaze medium to the mix and properly begin the blending process. Rather than focus on one part of the gradient at a time, I like to have my wet palette get nice and chaotic with all three colors available, and then just enter a flow state as I glaze across the entire base. After what feels like two to three passes, I'm in a place where I'm happy with the gradient transitions, so I switch to a smaller brush and paint on a proper border of meridius blue to tidy everything up. Then, as a kind of 2D edge highlight, I mix in some verdigris to paint a smaller line inside the border, followed by an even smaller line of pure verdigris. Then the base gets finished off with two coats of black along the rim. With the base done, it's now time for the messiest stage of painting the mech, which is dry brushing the underframe. I do this in two quick passes. The first round of dry brushing is a mix of dark iron and silver fox, followed by a lighter dry brush of pure silver fox. Now it's time to really get started with the painting and block out the main armor colors, starting with black, then green, orange, which as a lighter color needs a layer of gray underneath, and finally, Meridius Blue for the weapon blades and any areas I want to be glowing, like the eyes. 
Speaking of glowing, I have to paint this forehead section ahead of time so that I can put the detailed armor piece back on for the next stage, and I figured I might as well get the eyes mostly done while I'm at it. For the most part, each color got two thin coats, but I'm not too concerned about having really even coats because I'll be putting a lot of glazing and edge highlighting over top, which is what I'm starting on next. I give each section its initial edge highlight first, which is done with a mix of coal black, sick and livery green, orange fire, and then arcane blue. The gradients I have planned for the green and orange sections are by far going to be the most time-consuming part of this paint scheme, so I want to completely finish the black sections next, which I'll need some titanium white for to go along with the coal black. I won't spend too much time explaining this part because I tried to cover it in detail during my last video, but basically it starts with going over all the initial edge highlights with coal black, then adding a bit of white for a second thinner line, followed by a progressively thinner lines with more white mixed in as I go. By the time I'm at the final edge highlighting, I'm only hitting the sharpest edges and corners that would catch the brightest light from the theoretical light source I'm imagining shining down onto the model. Once the black is looking nice and crisp, it's time to get to work on the somewhat ambitious gradients I have planned. So I suppose now is a good time to explain my inspiration for the color scheme, which is from one of my favorite video games, Jack 3. It's like I said before. Ugh, sorry, I was doing research. Yeah, I know Jack 2 is objectively a better game, but Jack 3 has more guns in it. But also, we know what the real greatest game of the early 2000s was. Now as you can see here, Jack has a sort of green to yellow gradient in his hair, Daxter is a sort of orange to yellow color scheme, and the title here has a orange to yellow gradient. So I figured since two of the other protagonists, Heavy Arms and Oxyodl, are green and orange, that I could have the Buster Gundam have a green and an orange gradient that are unified together with the yellow, as indicated in the Jack 3 art. And at the same time, I could have a really obvious pilot to use in my fictional Gamma Wolves crew, as I indicated in the opening of this video. To get this double gradient started, I roughly paint some gold yellow near specific edge highlights to block in the directions in which I want the gradients to flow. I'm doing this according to my imaginary light source like I did with the black edge highlighting. I'm working on the green area first, since there is slightly more surface area when compared to the orange armor. The process here is the same as I've done on all my other hand-painted gunpla, except I've never done a transition between two different colors before. If you want to see a detailed breakdown of how I approach painting the armor gradients, I encourage you to check out any of the other videos I have for my Gamma Wolves projects, or my previous video where I specifically try and explain the process in detail on my Vidarbatos kit bash. The plan for the gradient was to go from sick green to livery green, then gold yellow. But having never painted a gradient with this drastic of a shift in color before meant it took longer than usual to glaze on and I think that caused me to move around to different sections and experiment more often than usual, so the transitions are not as consistent as they have been with my other models. Conversely, because of the more complex nature of this gradient, the finished armor is a lot more vibrant and exciting to look at, so by the time it's finished I barely notice the inconsistencies anymore. After the glazing is finished, the edge highlighting stage has a similar increase in difficulty because I'm applying it in the same method of doing progressively smaller and brighter lines, but with the added twist of having to follow the green to yellow gradient in accordance with the glazing. When the green is finished, I move on to the orange sections, which thankfully can go a bit faster due to the practice from all the green armor, as well as having less area to cover. I was somewhat worried that my gradient work was going to appear too messy throughout this whole project, because I was still trying to work as fast as I reasonably could, and the more complex colors made it harder to get the smooth transitions that I was used to pulling off with my brushwork. All I could do though was trust the process and power through to the end, because I was frantically painting to a deadline for the Gunpla competition at Odafest, which is the annual anime convention in my area. I was a bit frustrated with myself for once again underestimating the amount of time it would take to pull off the ambitious paint scheme I came up with, but thankfully I managed to finish it the night before the event. 
If you'd like to know more about the competition and convention, as well as see some pictures of the great entries other builders brought, I made some posts on my Instagram that you can check out. If you are at Odafest and got to see the Buster Gundam in person, leave a comment below. You would have been among the small group of people that got to see this finished model before the release of this video. Just like my patrons. Are you interested in exclusive benefits like HD wallpapers, direct messaging, and early access to content? Then please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash millennialmodelmayhem. It's by far the best way to support me, and you could have your name on display next to these fine sprinkles. And if you'd like to be more generous with your support, you could join the Mayhem Machines Bo, Moosepelheim, and Ryan, or the Gog Hands Dolfo and Janelle. The last bit of gradient and edge highlighting work to do is with the weapons and a few glowing sections across the body, which I'll be doing with the familiar turquoise gradient I've made sure to include on every Gamma Wolves project. Sorry that the color of glove makes it a bit hard to see the painting work here. It's an awkward coincidence. The gradient I'm building up on the blades is the same technique that I did on the armor, except the direction of the gradient isn't determined by the light source and is instead placed so that the darker end isn't neighboring the same shade, kind of like how I block in the base pattern. After the gradient work on the blades is done, I do the glowing effects by layering on just the arcane blue and verdigris into the center of the light source, then glazing the surrounding area with the same colors but heavily thinned with glaze medium. Similar glazing was also done to the areas surrounding the blades. My last minute addition to the painting was to add some more forest flux shifter paint to the V-fin, then mix in a little silver fox for a quick edge highlight. I also painted a few tiny details across the armor with forest flux off camera. Finally, I must protect all this tedious work with two coats of matte varnish. All right, boys, are you ready for your glory shots? Let's rock and roll, Dax. Despite being nervous about my work appearing too messy, I kept reminding myself that the painting usually looks bad in the middle of the project and that it'll all come together in the end. I think I had to do this more often with this model because of the crunch I put myself in to get it finished in time for Odafest. I once again underestimated the amount of time it would take to execute the green to yellow and orange to yellow gradients, but now that I see my vision realized, I couldn't be happier with how well everything looks together. The entire project start to finish took about 100 hours, which I'm pretty sure is my longest to date, and is pretty funny honestly when I remember that one of my original goals was to try and paint quickly and focus on reaching tabletop quality. I'll talk some more about what I think of this paint job, as well as the equipment loadout for the game later, because like I did with my previous Gamma Wolves project, I'm gonna save that for the upcoming retrospective video where I examine all seven of the projects I've done for the game. In addition to reviewing all my painting work, I'll also be doing the official protagonist's crew reveal like I did for the antagonists in my Wing Zero video. So I hope you're just as excited as I am. Can't you tell how excited I am? The final member of the protagonist's crew is now complete, but this is not the end of my Gamma Wolves journey. I hope you enjoyed watching my process of customizing this Master Grade Buster Gundam model kit, and I encourage you to leave a comment with any thoughts, feedback, or questions you may have. I'd also like to thank everyone who's helped the channel grow this year, because I've now surpassed 10,000 subscribers. Wow. If you'd like to continue helping the channel grow, you could become a patron, YouTube member, check out the links in the description, or just give me that good old free engagement here on YouTube or on my social media pages. Thanks for watching to the end of the video. I'm gonna take some time to recharge for a bit now that this really long project is complete, but rest assured, I'm still committed to doing those Gamma Wolves retrospective and battle report videos, so this is not the last broadcast you'll see from the Millennial Model Mayhem Content Zone. More like Morbius Model Mayhem, am I right? It's Marvin time. The algorithm demands that you lock on notifications and annihilate the like and subscribe buttons. And leave a comment.